Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, how many of you guys have heard about AngularJS before? Awesome. Um, can we put the uh, volume a little lower? It's kind of loud here. It echoes. Awesome. Sorry, I, I raise your hands. How many people heard of AngularJS? OK. And how many actually used it on the project? Oh, come on, no hands. That was going to get you a t-shirt, but uh, we'll have to wait. So Drew back there. <laughs> Drew back there, he has a whole bunch of t-shirts. Uh, show them off, man. Oh, they're kind of like, you know, like this, more of these. Uh, they come in whole different sizes. And on the end, when we're going to do a bunch of questions and answers, uh, we'll hand them out. So uh, get your questions ready. Anyway, so what is AngularJS? Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's what a web browser would have been had it been designed for web applications. Now, I know that's kind of hard to grok what exactly that means, but we'll, we'll try to talk about it. Uh, keep in mind, while I give you all these examples, is that it's pure JavaScript. Uh, there is no server-side component. Everything happens in the browser. So 100% client, 100% JavaScript, uh, no plugins or anything like that. It's open source on their MIT, and uh, Google is funding us. So that's a good thing always. So why is web development so hard? So when I'm not talking about building round-trip applications, I'm talking about building Ajax-style of applications. How many of you guys have tried building Ajax-style applications? OK, and was it easy? Or is it like a whole bunch of complicated things you got to remember and do, right? I think it's the second one, right? So a bit of history. Why did we get to this place of, of this complicated web app? So we all know HTML came in 89. It really was meant for documents, specifically scientific documents to be shared over the web. It really wasn't meant for web applications. The web applications really was an afterthought that got added afterwards. So come 95, and somebody gives us a scripting language. Uh, and come 2005, and all of a sudden, these applications like Gmail and Google Maps really push the limits of what's possible in the browser. And we, we call these applications as Ajax applications. And these apps are pretty amazing, if you think about it. And they're despite the primitive building blocks that the JavaScript and the DOM gives us. So now we're in 2011, and what has changed? What has changed is the JavaScript engines are amazingly fast. They can work with a lot more memory. The garbage collections have improved. The browsers have improved, and so on. But the way you write a web application is fundamentally the same. Nothing has changed since, since uh, 2005 when original Ajax applications have been introduced. And so this is what we were trying to attack. Now you say, well, isn't there already all these different technologies out there, you know, pick your alphabet soups that, that fit into this uh, category? And the answer is yes, but they solve a slightly different problem. And I'm going to group them into a couple of uh, different categories. One is we have what, what I call you know, treat the browser as a dumb terminal, which is the typical round trip application. You click, you go to a different URL, which regenerates a new HTML on a server, sends it back to the client. Right? We have lots of different excellent frameworks in this space, but it's a round trip application at the end of the day. Okay? So that set of technologies we're not interested. Another set of technologies uh, like XJS, Sprout Core, Cappuccino, Glit, uh, JSF, and so on, they basically say, you know, this whole browser and uh, CSS and DOM, it's just too complicated. So we're going to abstract everything away from you. And just forget, you, you're never going to have to touch the HTML or CSS or anything like that. We'll give you components. And you can build fancy apps with that. And, and that's a perfectly valid approach to building web applications. And some of these uh, technologies are super successful. But it really doesn't embrace HTML and JavaScript at its heart. They try to abstract it away and give you something else. And so while using those components is great, the end result is that all applications built using these technologies tend to look the same. And finally, we have applications like uh, technologies like jQuery and Clojure, which if you think about it, these technologies shouldn't exist because all they do is normalize the browsers. right? Uh, jQuery being the most popular one, obviously John has done a fantastic job on, on, on jQuery. It's an awesome library that's pretty much used by everybody on the web. And I can't imagine most applications being written without it. Uh, but the bottom line is jQuery in no way shields you away from the complexities of the web browsers. The syntax is a lot better. You don't have to think about different browsers. But the mental model of building a web app is the same exact thing uh, as it was in 2005. So nothing has changed. So let's look at some examples. 
pure HTML, right? We love this. Why do we love this? We love this because it's declarative, right? This is the simplest hello world you can build. Like it doesn't get simpler than this. You just say, I want to have a paragraph. The paragraph should have this following text, and that's it, right? This is so easy, my grandma can do it, right? And that's what we love about HTML. It's simple. So let's do a hello world in JavaScript. Let me scroll down so I can fit the whole thing on the page. This is ridiculous, right? Why is, why is Hello World in JavaScript so ridiculous? Well, it turns out that we have to know how the browser renders. So when the browser is rendering and it co we come across a script tag, we can't just write into the DOM because the DOM is not there yet. It hasn't been loaded. The script tag is usually above it. So what we have to do is we have to say, well, uh, we're going to register a listener onto a DOM. And when the uh, DOM says, I'm loaded, uh, we we're going to get notified, and we're going to be able to go and then get a hold of the, the paragraph that's inside of the DOM, and we're going to be able to write hello world inside of that paragraph. So far, so, so simple, except for the fact that IE is all different, and so we have to have if statements everywhere to make this feasible. Um, this is crazy, right? And this is what jQuery really solves. So if I go back to the jQuery example, you have this fantastic syntactic sugar Fundamentally, it's the same thing. We have the auto function, which executes when the document is finished loading. We have these fancy CSS selector for getting hold of the ID on the page. We have a nice method for writing into the DOM, which abstracts the differences between the browsers. All of that stuff, fantastic job. But fundamentally, we still have to know that there is a unload event. We have to create a callback. We have to register the callback, and so on and so forth. But really, if you think about it, what you really want to do is you want to simply say, there's a variable called greeting. It should be assigned the following text. And that variable should be bound to some location in the page. Just like you, know, you, you, you write spreadsheets. You, know, you just put some text inside of a spreadsheet, and you simply refer to it anywhere else by saying equals you know, A1, and then you get the second cell. What AngularJS does, notice what's missing out of here. There is no bootstrapping code. You don't have to worry about you know, when it's ready for you to run JavaScript and when it's not. You don't have to get a hold of the DOM element. You don't have to write to the DOM element. You simply create a variable, you, you assign to it, and you, you bind it. Well, that's all good, but you say, but you know, there's supposed to be a separation of the view and the controller. You're not, it's not a good idea to put it together. So really, a more canonical version would be this, to say, well, I have a, control, I have a P tag which is controlled by a particular controller, and it has a, a data binding location. In this case, it's greeting. And um, there's a greeting controller, and the greeting controller simply assigns to the variable greeting the, the value that it wants, and that's it. You're done. And magically, the UI gets updated, right? Notice that at no point did I have to create a callback. At no point I had to worry about when to execute my code. I didn't have to worry about uh, getting hold of the p tag through some CSS selector. Uh, all of that information is inside of the, the template, and the controller contains only the actual behavior of the, lot, uh, of the application. Now, this is simple stuff. Uh, it's really not that exciting, so let's do something more exciting. In order to build a web app, you need to be able to take input from the user. So, Notice that as I was typing, the UI updated, right? So we have, we have to be able to read from the user, and we also have to be able to write to the DOM. So this is implemented using jQuery. We have the input. Uh, we have the, uh, the p tag again. Uh, we have our function that is inside of a, uh, the dollar function, which is a special notation in jQuery for uh, you know, run this stuff when the loading is finished. We can have to get a hold of the name and the greeting element from the DOM. We have an update function which uh, goes and copies the, the contents of the, the input box into the greeting and does all of the necessary formatting. Uh, and then finally, on the end, we have to register a key down event on a name. And this is where the complexity comes in. You'd think that you can, when you get a key down event, you can just read the input. No, you can't. Turns out you have to wait for the, uh, the event to propagate. Uh, to the, what's known as a, the default handler inside of the browser, and only the default handler would update the input box. So you can't just read it and update it at that point. You have to do a set timeout zero to say, okay, finish what you're doing, Mr. Browser. When you're done, call me so that I can update the text. 
This is the kind of complexity that just kind of creeps into your application as you're building something. And so if you, if you think about it, the amount of code we actually wanted to do, which was make hello whatever you typed over here, should have been a one-liner, turns out to be this complicated set of 18 lines of callbacks and references and getting hold of things and so on. And so if you look at a typical application, you're going to discover that 80% of what you do is just dumb manipulation, dumb munging. And 20% of what you're gonna do is the actual interesting stuff of what the application does, right? And so we wanna get rid of this 80% portion. We want you to worry about your 20%, the actual interesting bits. So how do we do that? Well, as I said, uh, Angular is kinda of like a spreadsheet. So if I start typing, you know, notice, same exact behavior, it updates immediately, but notice how simple it is. All I'm saying is, I have an input, which is a first name, and that first name has to be bound into some p tag, and you're done. Think of it like a spreadsheet. You, you set up you know, your, your values, your formulas in a spreadsheet, and then you update one, and everything else automatically updates. You don't have to worry about how to bootstrap the code. You don't have to worry about how to register listeners. Uh, the only thing you're left with is what is the application actually doing. Let's get more complicated. So let's say we want to do the same exact thing, but this time we want to actually choose the salutation. Um, same exact stuff in, in jQuery. I'm not going to go through all of the pieces again, but you kind of get the idea that you have to register listeners and updates have to be happen at the right moment, et cetera. Now the thing I want to talk about is imagine you had to test this thing. We all test our code, right? Yes? So imagine you have to test this thing. Turns out, code written in this particular way is pretty close to untestable. Uh, I don't want to talk about testability. That's really uh, a separate discussion. Uh, but when you actually start building an application and you start having the requirements of testability as part of it, this, what is already relatively complicated, becomes even more complex. Anyways. Let's get back to Angular example. Uh, if I wanted to have the same exact behavior where the greeting can be selected, I really just have to define my outputs and they automatically get copied to what I want. Again, think like a spreadsheet, right? So am I really saying that jQuery is not that good? And then the answer is no, 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 no. We love jQuery. As a matter of fact, Angular is built on top of jQuery. It uses jQuery to manipulate the DOM for you. The, the thing is, jQuery is fantastic at DOM manipulation. But a web application is a lot more than a web app, uh, than DOM manipulation. A web application is a whole complex set of getting the inputs from the user, validating the inputs, uh, registering uh, you know, validators on it as to what is and isn't allowed for the user to be typed, talking to the server, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of other complexity that jQuery uh, really, it, it's not the scope of what jQuery is for. jQuery is for DOM manipulation, and it does an amazing job at that but it's too low level for what we want when we build web applications. So what Angular is, is it increases the level of abstraction. It is really what a web browser would have been had it been designed for web applications. Or to think of it differently, imagine that we said, hmm, if I wanted to build a web app, what would I really want to do? I really would want to have a controllers, I would want to have data bindings, I would have, want to have a first class support for forms, dependency injection, talking to servers, resources, and you make a wish list, and then instead of creating a library, which is uh, a set of APIs that allow you to do that, what you do is you build a shim. Does everybody know what a shim is? Right? It's the glue that teaches the browser new tricks. Right? We didn't give you a library with a set of useful functions that you can call to get the job done. We, gave, we taught the browser new tricks. And it turns out, not only do we teach the browser new tricks, we allow you to teach the browser new tricks. So all of these, what we call directives that you see over there, like ng controller or ng click or the, or the um, uh, double curlies, those are just instructions to Angular compiler that says, if you come across this inside of the HTML, I want you to execute this behavior. And all this behavior is programmable so that you can actually build up your own DSL, domain specific language, for your web application, right? If it turns out that in your web application you use tabs all the time, well, make up a new element called tabs. 
and Angular will automatically expand the tabs into the specific UI. As a matter of fact, the application that you see for, um, for the presentation is actually an Angular application. And what we did is we created a new element inside of the, uh, the let me do view page source. We created a new element called slide. Slide doesn't exist before, right? With a title on it. And we made a directive for Angular that basically says, if you come across a slide element inside of the HTML, I want you to draw a slide, which is all this complicated CSS and divs, et cetera, everything that it needs to produce a slide. So as you can see, if I want to add a new slide, all I have to do is create a slide element and put stuff in it, and um, I have a new slide in my presentation deck. So this application, uh, as you can see, does everything that you would want. It, it, it's bookmarkable, so as you can see, I'm on slide 24. We'll talk about that later. Uh, it has new behavior. It has new behavior to the, the browser, so the browser is now a presentation deck. It's useful for doing that. Anyway, so the last piece of thing that you need to do when you want to build a web application, I showed you how to read inputs, how to write to the DOM. The last piece you need to do is talk to the server. Without the server, you really have not, not very interesting application. So in this particular case, if I click greet, it will randomly select a greeting from uh, the server. And here is the logic for it. Basically, we have our controller. Uh, we initialize the controller to the world. And we have a, a greet method. So the button is connected to the greet method. And the greet method calls some uh, PHP little shell script that generates a randomly chosen, uh, chooses a greeting, and then we call the XHR with the URL, standard stuff that you're all familiar with, right? Except for one piece. Notice how we get a hold of the XHR. Like in jQuery, you would say, you know, jQuery.ajax or something like that. Here, the XHR was passed in to our function. But how does the system know that I wanted to do XHR? Well, it turns out we have dependency injection. Now, we do a very simple trick. Provided that you don't do minification, there's other ways of doing with minification, uh, we actually do, uh, we look at the function declaration, we parse it, and we say, ah, the string, the first parameter is XHR, and we have a repository of services, and we find an XHR service, and we hand it to you. In other words, you, when you're building a web application, one of the first things you have to do is kind of build the main method, which kind of assembles the app, waits for the certain events to happen, and so on. With Angular, you don't have to worry about that. You simply declare your controllers. You say, these controllers require these pieces. And you let dependency injection to assemble the application for you and hand it to you. Now, the added benefit of this is that when it comes time to testing and you wanted to see if this controller does the right thing, you really want to give it a fake XHR. You can't really do that with, with jQuery. The only thing you can do in jQuery is you can monkey patch jQuery so that that call to the jQuery can be mocked out. Uh, but with dependency injection, I can actually give you a different instance of XHR. And it turns out that Angular ships not just with the library that goes with the browser, but also with a mocking, a little tiny mocking framework that you include inside of your tests so that uh, we automatically provide you with a fake in-memory XHR service so that when you write your tests, you can mock them out. Now, speaking about tests, how many of you guys have heard of this thing called J uh, JavaScript test driver? A few of you guys. Excellent, excellent. So uh, Angular is written uh, using JavaScript test driver, and I can show you how the test runs. So earlier, I've captured a browser. This is my slave window, which runs my test. And I can execute my tests over here. Now, what I wanted to point out over here is that I've just executed 1,017 tests in two seconds. You should be saying, wow, right? Like that's a whole lot of tests, super fast execution. The nice thing about it is I didn't have to leave my IDE. Now, I went to the shell script to, to execute this. But what you do in your IDE is you set up a, set up a shortcut, a hotkey. Or in, in case of, of, of Eclipse, you can actually tell Eclipse to do something automatically when you save your file. So for example, in Eclipse, whenever I save my file, all of these tests execute immediately so that I don't have to uh, do context switch to the browser and run them, et cetera. And there is a trick, for example, in Eclipse that I can do run specific tests and, and so on. But anyways, I just want to talk about uh, the testability is an important piece of what Angular is. Typically, when you get a framework, you know, it, it solves a particular problem, but it doesn't really 
have an opinion on how you should be testing it. You say, well, you can do whatever you want. And while in Angular application, you can test in, in any technology you want, out of the box, we basically uh, give you with our opinion of, if you don't know, you can just use our setup. And so we provide you with setup for testability as well. And we feel that testability is something very important um, for it. But it's not just the fact that we can test the application. It's just that it's that the amount of code that you have to test is a lot less. Because um, we took away all of the code that manipulated the DOM. It became declarative. And so Angular takes care of the updates of the DOM. So you don't have to test that. The only thing you have to test is the behavior of the application. And so it becomes a lot more interesting. So another way the Angular helps is that because you don't have to write all these DOM updates, there's a whole lot of tests you don't have to write. The other thing is, I'm not sure if you noticed, let me go back a few slides, and I think this is super important, is that this controller makes no references whatsoever to the DOM. As a matter of fact, I could pull this controller out and run it in Node.js without any kind of fake DOM implementation or anything like that. Uh, this is important because we, by separating it out, by taking it out like that, we have really simplified and we've also decoupled the way the, uh, the web designer can go and set up the UI and change anything. Like a web designer can come and change my template in any way uh, he or she uh, pleases. There are no special CSS selectors that I have to maintain. Uh, if I, there, aren't, there isn't a special structure that says, oh, this input has to be inside of this table, otherwise I won't be able to find it inside of the code. You can really do anything you want in there because all of the information that you need for rendering is self-encapsulated. And explaining to a web designer you know, how to use a double curly is really not that difficult. You say, well, just whatever you think the text belongs, you just put the double curly in. Here's a set of strings that are allowed for you and you can assemble this thing. By the way, I love questions, so if you have any questions as I talk about this stuff, go ahead and ask. So we talked about dependency injection, uh, and what dependency injection also does is global state. Uh, how many people know that global state is just source of all kinds of evils, right? Have you figured this out already? Awesome, yes. <laughs> so it turns out that we took special care to make sure that we don't have global state in um, Angular, uh, and we fight this battle very hard every day, and so what the goal we have is that you should be able to run two Angular applications within the same HTML web page side by side and they should not interfere with each other, right? Uh, but it turns out if you do this, you also get all kinds of benefits from a testability point of view. And as I said, we're big fans of testability. So I showed you unit testing uh, story, but I'm gonna now show you the end-to-end -end testing story. So not only do we tell you, uh, we, we give you a setup of how to write your unit test, we also help you with your end-to-end -end tests. So let me show you our documentation. Here is a, an example of a, of a form uh, documentation. And and I am on the wrong URLs. Yes, of course I'm on the wrong URL. Um, so here's a form. Uh, if I modify the form, for example, it's red saying like, hey, you know, this stuff is required. This kind of comes out of, the, this kinds of features come out of the box. It also prevents me from saving the form. I can uh, reset it and then uh, if I'm going to save, if I modify it, I can save it. You can see kind of an internal state of it. But what's interesting about it is uh, we also provide a little test in the documentation that proves that this particular documentation web page is correct. And actually this whole documentation website is one big Angular application. And the result is that we can actually execute these tests. So if I go to, I got the URL code, here we go. So now we have a test runner, which is an end-to-end -end test runner, which goes and visits every single web page and execute that snippet of test code that we talked about at the bottom. Now this test runner is very interesting because it knows exactly how much to wait when you click on a button. So normally when you do Selenium testing, you click on a button, you have to wait because it's talking to a server and you don't know how much to wait. So usually you do some kind of pulling and now you have a choice. You can pull a lot, in which case you're gonna steal CPU time 
or you can pull not enough, in which case you're going to wait unnecessarily. With Angular, Angular test runner actually knows how Angular works internally, and because Angular itself is very declarative in nature, the, the test runner can introspect it. The end result of this is that the test runner, when, it, when you say click on a button, the test runner knows exactly how much to wait. Because when you click on a button that dispatches an XHR, Angular says, look, there's an outstanding XHR. You can't go anywhere because I'm not done. At some point, XHR comes back, and the Angular says, yeah, yeah, I'm done. And the test runner says, OK, let's go to the next step. And it executes the next step for you. The other thing is, let me see if I can show you. No, it's not going to. The other thing is that if you go to an example, For example, here's a test that says, um, go find me a button that contains the word fetch, and then click on it, and then we expect that the, uh, so that's the button right here. I'm going to click on it. Notice there's a delay because the server took a while to answer. Uh, and then uh, the expectation is that you know, the number of items is going to be greater than zero. But you say, well, wait a minute. This is synchronous code. How can you write synchronous code if, if uh, you, know, you click the button that's going to have a delay? That's part of the magic of what Angular does, is it allows you to write synchronous code in JavaScript. The way this is done internally is that we actually build up a state machine of what is supposed to be tested, and then it executes a state machine later on uh, so that it transitions to the individual steps. Anyways, I think we talked about um, testability for a while. So the difference, I think, of, of Angular is that we basically embrace HTML and JavaScript. We say HTML and JavaScript is the future. And the question becomes, how can we build a shim? How can we make it so that you can build the application that you always wanted to build, right? With the proper separation, with data binding, with proper uh, form validation, uh, a good testability story, uh, a good unit testing story, as well as, as, well as good end-to-end -end testing story. Uh, and this is, I think, something that most web frameworks uh, lack, uh, and, they, uh, and I'm hoping that you know, uh, competition is always a good thing, and I'm hoping that you know, maybe uh, that's going to spur people to say, hey, you know, it's not enough to just deliver a web framework. It's also important to deliver for the people you know, a story about how do you test this thing, both unit test-wise and end-to-end test-wise. Uh, so really, on the end, you know, Angular increases the level of abstraction to, to much higher level than uh, you know, something like jQuery would do. But at the same time, it still is HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, the things that you fundamentally love. Um, I already mentioned that we pure JavaScript. It's all client side. There is no server side component. So you can have anything you want on a server, a server side. If you like PHP, Java, whatever, even if you do Node.js and you have JavaScript on a server as well, perfectly good. Uh, 25K minified with jQuery optional. You, we, if you do have jQuery loaded in your web page, um, we will use it for DOM manipulation. If not, we have something called jQLite, which is basically a implementation of just enough of jQuery so that Angular itself can run uh, without jQuery. And all of this is 25K after gzipping. Um, we're, we're not quite at 1.0, so we have lots to go, f uh, but we are approaching fast. And yes, if you wanted to work on a, a cool project like that, uh, do let us know. And I hope that you have lots of questions. Yes? So, which browser is compatible? Which browser is compatible? Uh, very good question. So, uh, we, uh, this has been running on all the major browsers, including IE6, but we have stopped, stopped supporting IE6, not because there's something fundamentally that cannot be done with IE6, but if something goes wrong, it's just too much of a pain to debug. So <laughs> at this point, uh, we're basically saying IE8 and, uh, and uh, all the major browsers, including your, uh, your mobile phone, uh, Android, and so on. Actually, the end-to-end -end test runner that you have seen uh, earlier that actually runs on your, on your uh, browser, on your phone browser. And you can actually try it yourself. So if you go to, I'm going to put the URL over here again. If you go to this URL on your computer, you will actually execute all these tests. So you can give them a try on uh, most uh, browsers that we currently have. We also have, let me show you, let me kill this thing for a second. We also have a 
amazing build system. Uh, this is just Hudson, or oh, sorry, Jenkins. Uh, and this thing executes all of our tests on all major browsers. Um, so you can see the last successful build. And you can see that this particular, th these tests executed on Safari, Chrome, Microsoft Explorer 8. Uh, the Chrome and the Dev Chrome channel, the Opera, and IE9. So we're kind of covering most of the major browsers. Yes? Yes. Uh, so you want to see some uh, some bindings with respect to forms, HTML forms. Let's see. This is so. Here are the basic HTML inputs that you can see over here. Uh, this simply says input one, and then this is simply a binding over here. So. If I type, so you can see the binding updates. If I select A or B on the radio button, A or B updates, checkbox, true or false, pull down menu, and so on. So all the basic HTML forms uh, work. The added benefit is, oh, I don't have it. This, is, this, this build doesn't have the latest thing. Uh, there is also a validation that you can put on top of, uh, actually, this is still the old one. You can also put validation. So, for example, if you want to say something is only an integer, you, you know, it's going to complain. So, as you can see, this one says, yeah, not a number. Uh, so, there's validation you get as well out of the, the forms. Yes, yes. Uh, so the question was, a long-running application changes the structure. So there's a lot of pieces. So for example, let's talk about repeat. Oh, that's my favorite. Uh, ah, OK, let's, uh, let's do filter. So here is a set of phone numbers that you see over here. And there's a search box. Um, the set of phone numbers are. It's a table with a TR, and the TR inside of it says, for each friend in friends, run it through a filter, which is a search. This, oops, this search here matches the input search over here. So as I type in here, and I say, for example, say, I only want to see, uh, notice how the structure of the table automatically changes. So I only want to see text with M. So it automatically updates, right? This is very different than you would do something in jQuery. In jQuery, you would have to say, well, let me listen for the input changes. And when the input changes changes, then I have to add or remove DOM elements into the node. This is very different from that, because here you have a model, which is friends, which is just a list of elements that you have over here. And uh, you show only a subset of these elements. And so the jQuery, sorry, uh, Angular automatically worries about adding or removing things. There is other ones that you control the structure for, for example, ng show or hide, where you can uh, show or hide pieces of text. This works opposite. And more importantly, uh, I think it's view. We have routing. So routing is the concept of, you know, if your URL looks in a particular way, then this controller is in charge and this template needs to be loaded. So if I go and click on different sub, uh, different URLs, different chunks of and HTML would be loaded. So if you think about it, this, this application you see for looking at documentation is an Angular application. So everything from searching, navigation, uh, going places, all of this is really typical stuff that a web application will do. Yes? Okay. 
OK, so the question was, how easy it is to test your code that you write in Angular? Not just the one that is using, the one that you are already done. Mm -hmm. If you are building a module. Yes. Uh, so there is. Yeah, so how do you test anything that you write either for uh, Angular or with Angular? So with Angular, that's, that's a really easy answer because that's just a controller, and I already showed you the controller has no references to the DOM. We provide dependency injection. So really, it's, it, usually it's as simple as just instantiating the controller using a new operator in JavaScript, and then you just assert that the, that the controller modifies your internal state, internal model, uh, in the, in the in a expected fashion. If you're writing something like a directive, so let's mm, off the top of my head, I apologize. I remember here. No, I don't know. Oh, creating Angular directives. Here we go. If you're writing something like a directive, this is what kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is also quite testable, but you have to have real DOM at this point, which is not that big of a deal. You know, you can just instantiate a little tiny structure, put the elements inside of it, and then execute the directive. You tell basically Angular, go compile this piece of HTML. You hope that your, your directive will execute, and if the directive executes, you, you verify that the DOM has been transformed in a proper way. Then you can apply stimulus by changing the model, and again, you can verify that the DOM has been transformed in a correct way. So it's actually quite testable. Because we took all the pieces and we separated concerns for you and we gave you a kind of a framework of how, a scaffolding of how you should separate your application, uh, it makes it relatively easy to take this, uh, to unit test individual pieces. And let's get somebody from the back over there. Oh, we're running short on time. Uh, I promised some shirts. So Drew, maybe you can uh, get shirts to these folks that ask, uh, ask questions. I believe there was one guy here, one guy here, and there's, I think, another gentleman back there. OK, very good question. So the question is, how do you introduce something like Angular to an existing application? And that's something that I forgot to mention. Uh, but I, I, I think it's very important that, that it's not all or nothing propositions. Many of these technologies that I showed you earlier on the slide is really all or nothing, like Sprout Core or GWT. You can't really mix and match. Like, oh, you want to build a Sprout Core app? Perfectly fine, but you got to really drink the whole Kool-Aid from beginning to the end. Angular is much closer to the jQuery model, where you just sprinkle it on the pages you want. You don't have to sprinkle it on the pages you don't want. If you want to uh, have half of the page being controlled by jQuery and the other half by Angular, it's perfectly fine. If you have a round trip application and you slowly want to transition the round trip application to Ajax style application, you can just put Angular on the pages, but it'll still be a round trip app, and then slowly turn the pages into an Ajax application. So it is really like a pepper, you just spray, uh, sprinkle it out over your existing uh, setup that you have, and it plays very nicely with what you already have. What does NG stand for? Uh, it's a play on words, and it stands for, like, it sounds like Angular. Angular? No? Angular? No? NG? No? <laughs> no, not buying it. Okay. It's just short. I mean, how are you going to, you don't want to type Angular in front of everything, right? And so you just want to short something, and NG is the closest thing that I could come up with. So the question is HTML5. HTML5 says you have to have data dash, but all, HTML5 also says that any attribute that the browser doesn't understand should simply be left alone. Uh, so while HTML5 says you should prefix everything with data, that would be very mean for me to make you type that up all the time everywhere, so I, that's why I just have a short one. And it works just as well. There's no special magic inside of browsers that says, oh, it's data, I gotta do something. But I think we're out of questions, right? If you have other questions, catch me after everybody else, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks for listening, and hopefully you guys will uh, use it soon.